Welcome to another edition of Demystifying 5G, a video series brought to you by Roland Schwartz. So today I'm joined by my good friend and colleague Benoit Dura, our director for OTA and Antenna Test Solutions. Welcome Benoit. Hello Andreas, thank you. Hello everybody, um, I'm happy to be here with you today. We have a lot of interesting topics to discuss. Yeah, we, we're looking forward to that. Um, I'm really happy that you also brought two items that are part of uh, Roland Schwartz uh, test solution for OTA. So a few introducing remarks on that. Um, for 5G, we explore millimeter wave frequencies. Uh, at millimeter wave frequencies, we explore a higher path loss. We overcome that with the introduction, uh, integration of uh, antenna arrays into uh, devices and uh, infrastructure, so base stations. Uh, with antenna arrays, connectors are gone, so we have to carry out these tests over the air. And uh, to assess that performance, uh, we have to measure in far field. So we're talking about far field when the following conditions are met. The electromagnetic field defined by the E and H field vectors are orthogonal to each other and connected through the free space wave impedance of 377 ohms. E and H field vectors are transverse to the direction of propagation and equally important, the angular distribution is independent from the distance to the antenna. So for the experts in the audience, uh, the next question is then of course like where the far field starts. And that is typically uh, determined by using the so-called Fraunhofer distance. The Fraunhofer distance is a simple equation as simple as 2d square over lambda. Lambda connects us with the wavelength, but d is here the critical aspect because it describes the maximum dimension of the radiating source. So now the question is, what is the radiating source? If we consider, for instance, the full dimensions of a smartphone, the smartphone form factor, and uh, talking about a frequency band in the millimeter wave range, such as 39 gigahertz, a band that's uh, likely to be used in the United States for 5G, then we're talking about Fraunhofer distance and far field conditions are met at a distance of about six meters. That would mean large chambers are required, we have a high impact on dynamic range and such to carry out these measurements. So Benoit, you and your team looked into that, did the research on this. Can you talk a little bit about that and uh, explain to us if the Fraunhofer distance is really the right uh, measure for uh, far field? Yeah, this is a really good question. Actually, uh, this is not so clear because it has been uh, admitted by the community that uh, in OTA measurement that the Fraunhofer distance is the default far field distance. But really, it depends on what you want to measure. For sure, the Fraunhofer distance ensures a certain distance with the DUT. And this distance actually is made for controlling the phase curvature of the spherical wave front. Which means that when you measure above this distance, you know that your phase will not deviate by much than a certain amount. And the question is really, is it really what we need to do an accurate far field assessment? And eventually, for which parameters we're talking about? And the research we conducted in my team is really first looking at this peak beam directivity. What we found, and this is a simulation example I'm showing here, is that the field created by the antenna detaches very fast from the near field to the far field and creates really a far field condition at a very early distance. Uh, for example, here we show as uh, E over H impedance of the, of the wave as far as we go away from the device. And what we find in this curve is that on this specific antenna, we converge to a far field condition of 377 ohm that you were mentioning at about seven times shorter distance than from no far distance. So that means practically, if we're looking here at the data, the far field conditions are met much earlier than expected or uh, uh, concluded with the Fraunhofer distance. Yes, the far field conditions you mentioned before, they are actually achieved at earlier distance. And our theoretical results prove that. Uh, especially, again, if you look at the peak beam directivity. We have an example on this curve that if you have a DUT of 15 centimeter size, like a smartphone, radiating at 24 gigahertz, then if you apply a front over distance, then you end up having a 3.6 meter distance for testing OTA. But actually, we found that 1.14 meter distance would be enough to assess the peak beam directivity with 0.5 dB error maximum. And if we conduct the same exercise at 43.5 gigahertz, then again, we have a 6.5 meter distance uh, given by the Fraunhofer distance but actually we could measure at 1.74 meter if only interested in peak beam directivity. Then the question is really what happens if you are interested in other quantities? 
Okay. So what does that mean in terms of uh, location of the antenna within the device? Do I need to know that or do I don't need to know that? Yeah, well, that again depends on what you want to measure. So clearly with this reduced testing distance that we found, some errors are increasing, especially if you don't know where your antenna is. And in, uh, specifically, uh, we have this longitudinal taper error, which is somehow a geometrical error that sometimes when you measure with your probe around your antenna, your probe gets closer physically to your antenna or gets further away when it explores the sphere. And this actually modulates your pattern shape and may create significant errors. In addition, um, you can have errors which are due to the fact that this phase curvature is bigger. And if you look at secondary uh, lobs or nulls in the pattern, then they will be affected by this uh, phase curvature. So, in summary, if you are interested in peak beam directivity only and you know where your antenna is located, then the much shorter distance we found works very well. But if you don't know where your antenna is located, you have geometrical errors and in addition the phase curvature, which will increase, will increase your error on side lobe levels. Okay. So, uh, if I now think about uh, uh, another aspect here, we, we uh, uh, undertaking a lot of efforts to measure uh, or create far field conditions um, that my measurement antenna, my measurement probe is not impacting the measurements and so forth. That makes me believe we can actually measure nothing in the near field. Is, is that correct? No, that's not correct. And there are different approaches how to measure in the near field. And I think we will discuss these approaches because there are different solutions to solve this near field issue. Either you use near field to far field software transforms or you may also use hardware transformations. That's correct. So uh, why are you bringing that topic up? So uh, the two methods to basically create, create far field conditions is once we measure in the near field and do a software transformation and you mentioned also hardware. So can you explain the two concepts to us a little bit more in detail? Yeah, well Talking about near field to far field software transformation, this is something that has been well known in the antenna measurement com community for years. Um, you may actually probe the field over a certain surface enclosing your DUT. And if you have access to magnitude and phase data, then from the Wiggins principle, if you measure E field magnitude and phase over this surface, then you can reconstruct the field everywhere outside this surface and can then access the far field. This is what we show in this example here, that we have a base station at 3.5 gigahertz on this rotating table and our measurement antenna is on this elevation arm and we measure here with a VNA the uh, electric field in magnitude and phase over the sphere. And after that we can apply near field to far field software transformations, either using spherical wave expansion or also in our case, we apply an algorithm that's coming from a technical university of Munich called the FIAFTA, which is based on equivalent so uh, sources over a surface and has very powerful features. Uh, so this is one way. So phase retrieval is, is important for, to apply near field to far field transformation, correct? Yes, this is correct. So in the case I'm showing here, it's very easy because you have access to a connector in the device. Then you get your phase reference. So the next question is, what do you do when you don't have access to this connector? There are also solutions and uh, this is another solution I'm, I'm showing here that what you need in this case, for example, is a multi-port phase coherent receiver. In this case, you can attach an additional antenna which is uh, fixed with respect to the DUT and in this case it's attached to the uh, table that's rotating in azimuth and then you use this antenna as the phase reference. So you will connect it to uh, your oscilloscope in this case, which is a time domain uh, acquisition capability, and the two other ports of your measurement antenna for measuring the two polarizations will also be connected to the oscilloscope. Uh, then you can also add this positioner trigger that helps you synchronize your acquisition over time with respect to the movement of the whole structure. And with this, if you have a phase coherent receiver like we have here with RTO 2064, you can actually obtain from the phase difference between the signals from the measurement probe and the reference antenna, the phase difference that comes from the propagation. So you get your phase from an outside antenna. You don't need any more access to the connector 
and that works also with modulated signals. Okay, Benoit, this triggers a lot of more questions on near field and far field measurements, but this is something we will discuss in another video. In summary, we learned that it really matters what you want to measure. Fraunhofer distance is a good approximation to start with, but if one is only interested in peak beam directivity or ERRP, then you can significantly reduce the measurement distance and use much more compact test solutions as proven by the Roland Schwartz research. We offer both larger and very compact OTA test solutions. So thanks again, Benoit. And I'm really looking forward to discussing more on these in our next video in our video series, Demystifying 5G.